Good morning. My name is Becky Woodward, and I'll be reading our scripture this morning from 1 Corinthians. We'll be in chapter 12, and we'll begin in verse 4. If um, you don't have your copy of the scripture this morning, you can follow along on the screen, or even if you did. So we'll start in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. This is the word of God. All right. Thanks, Becky. Well, good morning. I'm Ben. I'm one of the elders here. I was excited about this because not only is it time change, but also spring break. So sometimes I walk in wondering if it's going to be like Redeemer Small Group for, uh, for service in the first one. But you guys are champions, so let's go. All right, well, we just wrapped up our All In series last week. This week, we're jumping back into our First Corinthians series. So we're going to be in chapters 12 and 14. We'll cover chapter 13 next week. But some, uh, some interesting chapters that we're jumping into today. This will be fun. And we're going to talk about spiritual gifts. We're going to talk about how they're used in the church, the nature of them. So to set up the time, um, one thing is you can maybe imagine the, the Corinthian church as like this first century version of a, of a reality TV show, right? So... Instead of the, the, the people competing for a rose or a record deal, they're really competing for this like spiritual spotlight together, and there's kind of drama happening, so I'm just going to call it Corinthians Got Talent. That's fine. I know it's stupid. Um, but genuinely, I, I think a lot of this relates more to us today than we might think. So we're going to jump back into verse 4 uh, and read this again. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but it's the same God who empowers them all and everyone. All right, so it's important to see here that according to Paul, when he's talking about spiritual gifts, he's also including varieties of service, varieties of activities. And service here, it's like this super broad term for all kinds of work. Um, it's including things, I mean, it could be like waiting tables, it could be changing a tire. I mean, even everyday acts of service is kind of included in this term. It doesn't really feel very spiritual to put tables away or to take out the trash. It's not what we typically think of when we think about spiritual gifts. Um, so one of the questions I had was, why does he use these terms here? Well, D.A. Carson makes the point this way. He says, Paul uses these three terms to describe the full range of what we might call spiritual gift phenomena. One conclusion is unavoidable that Paul tends to flatten distinctions between charismatic gifts and non-charismatic gifts in the modern sense of those terms. So you can kind of think of it this way. The, the Corinthians kind of devolved into these two factions on this specific issue. You had the first group, the charismatics, um, that were saying, hey, if you're spiritual, you should be showing that through speaking in tongues. We'll talk about tongues a little bit later. The second group was the non-charismatics, and they're basically, um, they're super skeptical of any of those expressive gifts in general. And Paul is coming and saying that the more miraculous gifts and the more everyday gifts are equally spiritual. Like one's not more spiritual than the other. And maybe you've been around this kind of divide in the past, um, especially if you have any kind of charismatic background. I mean, you, you might have seen some stuff. You might carry some scars from it. Um, you might have even seen this, this specific issue divide and blow up a church. Um, I bet most of you, at the very least, have probably seen some of the viral videos that go around of like people running around church buildings, speaking in tongues, uh, you know, stomp dancing. Um, I remember an old one with, you know, flailing a jacket, like slaying people in the spirit, kind of gets wild there. Usually it's really good music in the background just to hype it up. My first exposure to this whole topic was when I was in a church service in college. I was still like a, a pretty new believer. I remember the pastor towards the end of his sermon, he started talking about um, speaking in tongues. 
And I remember, um, I, I'm, I was sitting there remembering thinking, like, the gears were turning in my head. He's talking about this thing. I've never heard of it. It's just like, where are you going with this, buddy, you know? Um, I don't know what he's talking about. In general, I was kind of skeptical, a little defensive. Um, but he was up there saying uh, things like, you know, just surrender your tongue to the Holy Spirit and speak, you know? I just remember sitting there thinking, like, surrender my tongue. Like, I'm full f- fight or flight mode right now. Like, I'm looking for the exits. I'm not going to, what are you talking about here? I'm, I remember just hearing sounds, you know, throughout the room. Um, looking around, the room was pretty electric. Um, I, I, the best thing I could describe back then was, like, feeling like I'd walked into the wrong large lecture class or something like that. Like, I felt so out of place. Um, I was standing back there, and, and uh, if anything, was protecting my tongue. I mean, I was, like, defending it like Davy Crockett, the Alamo. I'm like, nah, uh come and take it. I'm like, super defense is guard is up, guard, guards up. So anyways, that's how I started exploring this topic of spiritual gifts. Um, I hadn't read 1 Corinthians at all. Uh, by temperament, you could probably tell, I came into this whole thing siding much more with the non-charismatics. And especially in West Texas, that might be most of us here in this room. Um, well, here, Paul's got corrections for both groups. So we're, we're all on the hook together. So what do we make of this so far? And really the important question is how does God frame this whole thing in the text? Well, I think we could see four themes um, to start. The gifts are varied. Their unity is essential. Charity is key. And sovereignty is God's. All right, so let's start with variety. Here we have a list um, that Becky read. It's not exhaustive, but you can check out this chart just as an example. We won't have time to deep dive each gift today. We'll just focus on two specific ones later, prophecy and tongues. Uh, But this gives us um, some scope to the variety of gifts that God distributes among us. And it might sound obvious, um, but they're called gifts because they are gifted to us, right? So we didn't earn them. Um, The word here in the text is charismata. It's where we get our word charisma from. Even though normally when we use the word charisma today, we mean something more like confidence. Or if you ask my kids, they're going to say riz. And that's more like some, their ability to woo the ladies or something like that. I don't know. I try to keep up. But really, really the root of the word is charis in the grace. It means grace uh, uh, in the Greek, sorry. Um, so these are gifts of God's grace that he distributes among his church. Carson adds this about the Corinthians context. He says, Whatever might be truly considered spiritual is better thought of as a gracious gift from God. The quest for an individualizing and self-centered form of spirituality was in danger of denying the source of all true spiritual gifts, the unbounded grace of God. So he's hitting at the heart of the issue here, like the self-centered spirituality. We'll come back to that in a little bit, but we've got to remember that any giftedness that we show comes from God, first and foremost. All right, next theme, unity. We'll read verses four through six again. He says, now there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but it's the same God who empowers them all and everyone. So what does this mean for us? I think one of the things is that our unity doesn't come from uniformity. It comes from sharing in the same spirit. Um, one of the things that popped in my mind was the old hymn, um, nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling, because we are all unified in that we come empty-handed before God, and we all share in his gift of grace through faith in Jesus, his death, his resurrection for us. So we all share in that. Unity through uniformity is weak anyway. Um, that applies socially, that applies genetically. I mean, that's why you can't marry your cousin or your brother or sister for that matter. Like diversity isn't a threat, it's actually an asset. So this is where Paul goes in the second part of chapter 12. Um, We won't cover that today, but we basically need all of us with this diversity of gifts in the body. And again, the idea of uniformity is really fragile um, because it just relies on these surface level similarities between us and those things can change over time. But this kind of unity that he's talking about is resilient because it's founded on our shared experience of grace. All right, in charity, verse seven, he says, to each is given the manifestation of the spirit for the common good. So many times spiritual gifts aren't for the building up of the church, for the common good. We should have immediate red flags about them. Um, imagine somebody with the gift of knowledge or they've got deep theological understanding you know, instead of using their insight to help or to empower people, they use that 
understanding to make somebody feel small or maybe to create little cliques in the church for these intellectual elites or something like that. Or maybe somebody with the gift of prophecy, instead of offering encouragement, you know, they use it to manipulate or to exert influence or intimidation to get their way. So spiritual gifts aren't trophies to show off. They're tools for serving for the common good. We'll talk more about prophecy later, but one easy application question here is if you think about your gifts, um, to what extent are you using them for yourself versus for the common good? Or even maybe not at all in the church. So that's a question that you can ask yourself, your friends, your gospel community this week and talk about it. And finally, um, sovereignty. So verse 11 spells it out here. It says, all of, um, all of these are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. So you can't help but notice that this, this isn't some kind of spiritual free-for-all. There's no wish list happening here. God doesn't make mistakes. In fact, he's got this whole picture of redemption all of time. His entire creation is in front of him. And it's within that vast framework that he's handpicking our gifts and gifting them to us. And to be real for a moment, I think we, if we're honest, we probably look around fairly often and compare ourselves to one another and think, man, my gifts, why couldn't I have gifts that were more impressive, maybe more significant gifts, you know? Am I defective or, you know, can I even make a difference? Maybe I got the wrong gifts and we have these feelings. And in this passage, I think to all of those whispers of doubt, God shows us that he's got a plan and he's carrying it out with precision. He's intentionally doing that. Every gift that he distributes, including yours and mine, fits perfectly into that plan. And gifts aren't about us proving that we're right with God either because he chose them. So really, we just need to embrace our gifts with humility and courage and focus on serving one another and not let those kind of seeds of doubt take root and immobilize us or sideline us. All right, brief intermission here. We're not gonna cover 12 through 26 today. Dusty's gonna cover those in a few weeks. So we're gonna jump down to chapter 14 because we're gonna cover chapter 13, the love chapter next weekend. So we'll be in 14 for the rest of our time today. All right, verse one, he says, pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. For the one who speaks in the tongue speaks not to men, but to God. For no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the spirit. And on the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. The one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. All right, so this is, this is pumping me up. It's like prophecies and mysteries and tongues and stuff. I mean, some of you might be weirded out by this. I'm super pumped, I get excited. Uh, I love when like our experience of God that we kind of put in this neat convenient box just gets the lid blown off of it by scripture. So I'm here for it. Uh, but he says, earnestly desired these spiritual gifts. Um, the problem is usually we have no idea what he's talking about here. And sorry to say, there's not really like a quick, easy, simple definition. We've got some ground to cover. We've got some work to do to understand it. So if you're in for it, um, we're gonna hit prophecy first. We'll talk about tongues second um, and wrap up there. All right, prophecy. In its simplest form, prophecy, the, the gift of prophecy is not fortune telling. Um, it's about speaking God's truth into the present. A better word probably would be to call it forth telling. Um, it's about making the truth of God accessible and actionable, not just like something mysterious and mystical. Verse three says it, says it's for the upbuilding, encouragement, and consolation. One helpful definition, Grudem defines it as telling something that God has spontaneously brought to mind. So when Paul emphasizes prophecy over tongues, he's prioritizing these clear, understandable messages that build up the church. It's not just about predicting the future. It's about communicating God's will. It's about comforting. It's about encouraging. Um, it's about serving one another in a way that everybody can understand. Okay, so if it's not just about predicting the future, is it ever about predicting the future? Attention, what is he gonna say here? Uh, I mean, yes, sometimes. How about that? Um, we'll go to the Bible. Take Agabus. You guys know Agabus, right? No, nobody knows Agabus. Uh, Acts 11, we'll look at him. He predicted a severe famine. He predicted Paul's imprisonment. Pretty cool. Uh, Acts 11, verses 27 and following. It said, now in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. 
And one of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the spirit that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined everyone according to his ability to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. In Acts 21, it says, while we were staying for many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea and coming to us, he took Paul's belt and he bound his own feet and hands. Quite a flair for the dramatic here. And he said, uh, thus says the Holy Spirit, this is how the Jews at Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Okay, so and sure enough, there were many famines that happened during Claudius' reign. Paul was imprisoned, though by the Romans, not by the Jews, but close enough, Agabus. Um, years ago for me, I experienced this in a really weird way. Um, I was eating a late dinner at Rose's with some friends from college ministry down at uh, First Baptist Church here in town. And across from us, there was uh, another group about the same size of us um, sitting down to eat. And we recognized several of them as students from the St. Elizabeth's Catholic Church College Ministry. So we said hi to them, sat down. I'm headed to the salsa bar, as one does. Uh, and on my way back, this girl from the other group just comes up. I, I don't know her. She just comes up. She stops me mid-stride. She looks me straight in the eyes. And she says, God told me that you will be a priest. And I think my response in the moment was, okay. You know, I didn't know what to say. I sat down, I think I told my friends, and we all were kind of the same, same, same opinion. It was just like, you know, that was weird. That was really weird, yeah. I mean, I was sitting there, I was thinking to myself, hey, I'm not Catholic. Uh, I have no sense of call to ministry, because at the time I was like a baby Christian. I mean, I barely knew what was what. Um, so in hindsight, though, I can't help but look back and take that as an encouragement from the Lord. Like I became a pastor years later, you know, close enough, right? Um, and so I take that as an encouragement from the Lord. So whether it's like that, or Agabus, that kind of stuff, or if it's like something more every day where God just brings somebody to mind where you think, you know, man, I should reach out to so-and-so and just encourage them. Or maybe somebody comes up to you and they just, they just tell you, hey, like God put you on my heart. Um, I've been praying for you. I just wanna check in and see how you're doing. So whether it's like that or like this more everyday experience, um, I mean, what a gift. I don't know if you, you've ever experienced that where somebody has come up to you that, that the Lord brought you, you to their mind, but it's such an encouragement. Like it's a gift to the church whenever that happens. So it's one way we can serve each other and build each other up. So with all that, on the other hand, we do have to balance things like that out with the need to exercise some serious caution, right? Not all who claim to have the gift of prophecy are legit. You see this in Matthew 7, where Jesus said, beware of false prophets who come in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves, right? So sheep's clothing, which means you can't tell that they're false on the outside, on the surface. They seem really genuine. And back in our passage today, Paul talks about caution like this in verse 29. He says, let two or three prophets speak and let the others weigh what is said. So we're supposed to discern God's truth together. We're supposed to evaluate what is said. In another passage in 1 Thessalonians 5, he says, do not despise prophecies, but test everything. Hold fast what is good. So if someone offers a prophecy, we should test it against God's word and only hold on to the good parts of the prophecy. That's what he's saying. And I wonder, why would he say it that way? Do not despise prophecies. I think it's a little bit like making friends. What I mean by that is, if you've had a relationship, a friendship that's developed, and then at some point over time, that relationship soured, or maybe there was betrayal and hurt, you come, at that, you come out of that relationship just feeling like, dude, why, why even try to make friends, you know? Like you end up despising the whole effort in general. And I think that that's kind of like what he's talking about with spiritual gifts. I think he's saying that he knows that living the Christian life together is tough enough. He knows that um, with these different gifts among the church and these threats from false believers, that he's telling us, don't reject the work of the Holy Spirit in our church just because other people abuse the gifts. Instead, we should depend on the Spirit, not despise his work. So I don't know if you can relate with any of this. Um, if you feel like you kind of despise the gifts or just have a, a, a disposition that way negatively towards it. Um, and if so, I, I would just say, you know, take some time with the Lord and ask why that is. Why do, you, why do you think it's hard for you to experience or be open to the Spirit in these ways? 
you know, it might be some past trauma. It might be some hurt from a bad spiritual leader that caused some damage with you. That's probably justified. But I think that's worth going to the Lord about and maybe having a conversation with him. Whatever it is, one of my prayers is that we would learn to lean more into the wonder and the mystery of God. After all, if we're not a little bit in awe of what God does, I mean, are we even paying close enough attention here, you know? Like, if we're not in awe of that. And a quick sidebar, um, some people ask, um, okay, Ben, so if somebody prophesies, uh, does that carry the same authority as Scripture? Am I turning to the back of my paper Bible and I'm writing down what they say because God revealed it? Or another way that we've heard this too is, you know, sometimes a guy says to a girl in church, God told me that you will be my wife, you know? And girl says, well, God failed to notify me and you're creeping me out. So uh, I would say, so no to both, I think, scripture here. Um, we're not adding to scripture and God told me so isn't some final word. Uh, otherwise, why would he tell us to weigh prophecies and test them against scripture? We're fallible, scripture isn't. It's the highest authority. So maybe say something like, okay, maybe. Let me test it. Let me pray about it and see. Okay, so that's prophecy. Let's look at tongues. Um, the stuff that you guys probably didn't know you were in store for coming to Redeemer this morning. <laughs> but we're here for it. Uh, okay, so in the book of Acts, we get a peek into the early church's experiences with tongues. Uh, these weren't just random babblings. These were understood as real languages. Acts 2 uh, it says, and the disciples were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And at the sound, the multitude came together and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. They were amazed and astonished, saying, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. So Pentecost showed us tongues as languages, understood from people all over the world. And back in our letter, Paul saw tongues as this cognitive, meaningful expression. Now fast forward to today, and linguists have entered the chat. Uh, they've recorded and analyzed uh, modern instances of speaking in tongues. And what they found is they don't really look like the Pentecost kind of tongues. Um, what we see today doesn't really match up with these patterns and structures of known human languages. It's more like unique verbalizations that kind of resemble language. For example, one interesting thing that they found was that if I was the one who taught you to speak in tongues, that your tongues would mirror mine. Um, there'd be little variation in the sound patterns between us, even if there was a whole group of us. And if French, say, was our native language, uh, then we wouldn't use uniquely English sounds, like the TH sound uh, that, that the French doesn't use and so on. So tongue speakers basically sounded stereotypically like the person who guided them, and the sounds stuck generally to the speaker's native language. But here's where it gets interesting a little bit. Um, despite, despite that, despite not being a recognizable human language, this modern expression of tongues could still carry meaning. And what I mean by that is it could be like kind of think of like a coded angelic message. Think about it kind of like spiritual Morse code. Not everybody can understand it, but if you have the right key or the right interpretation, the message can still get through. Here's an example. I'll explain what I'm talking about. All right, borrowing an illustration, suppose the message is praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. So if you remove the vowels and spaces, it might seem strange, but in Hebrew, a lot of times it's written without most vowels. Greek manuscripts don't have spaces between the words. You end up with that. Now, if you just add kind of an ah sound after the consonants and then break it up into arbitrary bits, and if you tried to read that out loud right now, it would kind of sound like transcriptions of modern tongues today. Some of you doing it. I was hoping y'all would, yeah. Uh, but what's crazy is that that still actually conveys the original message provided you know the code. So the message still is an encouragement about God's mercy. And if you're like me, maybe you're thinking, well, what if we don't have the code? Like, how do we know what's real? How do we know it's not? Kind of exactly. I mean, there's no, there's no rock solid way to test this kind of thing. And I think that's why we've got these whole chapters in 1 Corinthians where he's cautioning us and he's giving us guidelines around the church's use of tongues and the giftings. Look at verse 27 and following. He says, if any speak in a tongue, let there be only two or at most three, and each in turn, and let someone interpret. 
But if there's no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in the church and speak to himself and to God. For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. So the Corinthians could have talent, but Paul says, if you're speaking in tongues uh, and no one can interpret, it's more like you're just singing in the shower. You know, it feels really good, but it's not really helping anybody else. Um, it does seem, though, that this, this practice of maybe a private prayer language is valid, has a place, encourages the person that's praying. Um, you can see Paul's reasoning for that in uh, verses 14 through 18. So privately praying in tongues is kind of like that, and everyone's not going to have that gift of tongues. We shouldn't turn into Redeemer's Got Talent either, where this gift becomes the main attraction, or any of us become the main act. Um, people have asked us sometimes over the years, too, what we would do in Redeemer if someone stood up and started speaking in tongues. And I always just point back to this passage. I mean, Paul's really clear about it. If there's no interpreter, they should keep silent and pray to God. In verse 19, he even says that when the church gathers, he'd rather speak five understandable words than 10,000 words in a tongue. So I think if Paul had the socials, maybe he'd be running a hashtag speaking in tongues challenge and have people stitching in their interpretations or something like that. Um, because tongues are really about building up the church. They're not really just about a talent show here. Okay, so in closing, he gives us some final context in verses 23 and following. He says, if therefore the whole church comes together and all speak in tongues and outsiders or unbelievers enter, will they not say that you are out of your minds? But if all prophesy and an unbeliever or outsider enters, he is convicted by all. He is called to account by all. The secrets of his heart are disclosed, and so falling on his face, he will worship God and declare that God is really among you. What an image for us. I mean, a church that's, that's so alive with God's spirit that even skeptics are moved by God's presence. Um, there's conviction, there's worship. And that's really our prayer in closing. Um, we, we're praying that, that Redeemer, we'd be a Redeemer that desires the spiritual gifts and not despises them. We'd be a church that's about building up and not showing off. And so with that, let's pray. We'll ask for God's help to be that kind of people as a church. So let me pray. God, Father, help us to understand um, uh, a lot of these confusing topics and things that are new or foreign to a lot of us. Help us to see what you've told us about what you've called us to as a church, to build one another up. We know that that starts in our heart first. So I just pray that you would do that in us first um, so that outwardly, as we treat each other as a church, we'd be about serving one another, not about showing off. So help us in that way. You know our struggles. You know the ways that, that um, we, we tend to be self-focused and, and uh, look for affirmation and approval um, from others. And uh, help us to walk by your spirit, trusting you. Help us to heal from past trauma with this kind of thing. Um, people in this room that, are, that are, um, have a lot of stories tied to this and some negative baggage. I just pray that you'd bring healing to us. You'd bless us in that way. Um, we're grateful. Help us. In Jesus' name, amen.